As you can see here, the end grain is going to soak in way more wax than the regular grain surface of the wood and therefore get a much deeper coloration or deeper value. Perhaps there is some fancy solution to this problem, like sealing the end grain with watered down PVA glue or something like that. But I don't know one at least, I haven't experimented with this very much, so I'm not sure. Knowing that this is the end grain side of the base, however, and the sides of the base means that the front and the top surface are going to be very similar in color and value and the sides will be a bit darker but they won't stand out as much or be nearly as visible as they're not really part of the focal point of the finished piece. Standard procedure when doing this is to spray from at least the length of the can away from your sculpture or perhaps a touch more. Any closer than that and the paint will build up fast and there's a great chance that you will get drips. Any further back or away and the paint can dry mid-air leaving you with a dusty dry surface that where the paint can almost be brushed off like it was dust. So try to stay in the middle ground where neither happens. Always move the spray paint when the nozzle is depressed, don't keep the can in the same place at any length of time, for any length of time. Pay close attention as well to the nozzle since the nozzle can sometimes become clogged. This did occur to me a bit here with this particular brand of spray paint which I'm not advocating for or against. But some of these spray bottles, they don't have the best nozzle design and when it clogs it will sort of sputter and spray blobs of paint onto your sculpture. Once that happens, I'm sure it will happen to you as well, you have to act quickly using a brush or a soft cloth, tap those blobs out so they don't dry like a positive paint lump on the surface of your piece. Clean the nozzle using paper towel and always do a test on a surface of non-importance before beginning to spray paint again, like the temporary base or a plastic sheet or something like that. I'm using a deep dark olive green color here now the choices of color are of course infinite and there are no easy solutions or formulas that will ensure success here. Experimentation is going to be key. Test out a whole bunch of different combination of colors and materials to see what you get. I would suggest if you intend for your sculpting to do most of the talking to try not for the two colors since we're doing two layers in this scenario, try not for the two colors to be too far apart from each other in value or in color. This will drastically increase the visual impact of the modeling, for example, usually, or it will distort from the modeling because the surface will be so crazy looking. And the effect might end up being much more than you intended. A typical one that has happened to me before is that you end up with a much harsher and extreme result modeling wise than what you were happy with in the clay. So every transition looks really dark and deep. Staying somewhat conservative with the, with the layers of paint or with the value difference in the layers of paint will add visual interest in terms of keeping the surface from being too uniform, but at the same time not breaking it up so much that the paint job becomes the most interesting part of the piece and not how it was sculpted. As I said, there are no right or wrong answers here, but personally I prefer a surface that sort of mimics the effect that I had in clay. Or perhaps it's better to say a surface that keeps what I liked about the sculpture in clay intact. It doesn't have to look like clay anymore in terms of color or value, and it's not going to, but the overall feel will be the same, or somewhat similar at least. Be careful of the creases as the spray paint is going to have a hard time getting in there. What you don't want to do is spray paint a ton to get paint into the creases and in doing so covering up a whole bunch of details or create thick plasticky layers of paint or create drips and drops. Sometimes in order to get into these creases I'll spray paint, I'll spray the paint into a cup and then use a brush to brush the paint into these hard to reach areas. If you then spray paint over the top once more, lightly, like you did everywhere else, you'll be able to hide pretty well, pretty convincingly, whatever crime appeared when you used your brush. You should probably also start out by trying to get paint into the creases or spray 
into the creases before beginning to spray everywhere else. As that will ensure that we don't have a lot of buildup of paint when trying to get into them. We also have to watch out for areas that are underneath or facing downwards, like the downturning planes inside the eye socket or underneath the arms and the legs. These are areas that will require us to do a bit of gymnastics to get to. We must sort of spray at awkward angles, spraying upwards, bending over to make sure we coat these areas as well as everything else. Especially the bottom of forms, like the downturning plane of the eye sockets, can look really bad if we don't get paint up into them. It'll sort of look like the sculpture is being lit from below, like we're in some sort of 1950s horror movie or something like that. And it will seriously contradict the effect that we have worked hard both in clay and in resin to achieve. Of course, we're not done with this just yet, and the spray paint itself, using one layer, is rarely going to give you what you are after. It will always look a bit cheap, I think, on its own, one layer of spray paint, which is why we're going to layer more colors over the top of it to create a more interesting surface that doesn't appear too much like a plasticky toy. We're back inside the studio for the final step in this process, which is going to be putting the wax onto the sculpture. As you can see, we're still on a temporary base, and inside you can see a little bit easier the color, the real color of the spray paint, at least with one of the cameras, a bit better than outside in the shade where the camera was certainly struggling a bit with the dynamic range of the strong Tuscan sunlight. We're not using paint here, we're going to be using wax, and wax is often used as a finisher on sculpture, though not traditionally in this way, I think, meaning on top of spray paint. But what it is often used for is to cover or protect bronze sculptures. Normally a translucent wax would be used, the bronze will be heated and then the wax brushed on and sometimes the wax will be applied, thinned out and be sprayed on with a spray gun. And this is done to protect the bronze patina and sort of seal it from the element elements and keep the patina from changing because if the patina, if the bronze piece itself is out getting oxygen on it, it will continue to oxidize and change. The wax seals this, seals the bronze and stops this from happening. The wax layer is rather resistant when placed indoors, but it does fade over time when placed outside in the elements, which is why you will often see bronze sculptures look a certain way if they're very old and have been exposed to the elements. They'll look really green, this like bright, Ferric green. But rest assured, the bronze sculpture definitely didn't look like that when it, it was placed outside. That's something that happens when the wax wears off in the elements and the sculpture oxidizes. Our sculpture is going to have the wax layer be the same colored wood wax that we used before to finish the base. From what I can tell, it's just a colored version of beeswax, so essentially just beeswax with pigment, some sort of pigment in it. Nothing very fancy or special at all. The intention here is to create a matte or satin surface with a bit of random breakup in the color. If we used vastly different colors here, for example a much lighter green and the same dark wood wax, this breakup would be very strong and stand out like crazy. Here the subtle color variations on the surface will be just that, subtle, as the value difference between the spray paint and the wax is rather small. To create a random texture that's even and lacks streaks from the brush, we're going to tap the wax onto the surface. The wax has to be heated up a bit and we'll do that very simply by using friction, just brushing it around. I get some wax from the can on my brush and then I'll rub most of it off while using friction to heat it up on a paper towel. The action of rubbing the wax off the brush keeps the layer from getting blobby and the buildup of wax from being thick and also uneven. It also warms the wax up through friction so that it will lay down on the surface easily and 
more even. On the surface, the wax will cool and firm up and create a protective surface. While certainly not extremely durable, it will be somewhat durable and definitely capable of being touched without coming off, though rubbing the surface with intent to remove the wax will still remove the wax and ruin the finish.